Usually I get a chance to preach to those who are in the parking lot. I always say in the parking lot, in the courtyard, and at home. Uh, but today it's a few staff members scattered around the worship center, which we're in the process of actually redoing carpet, putting the seating back in, uh, getting this place ready, because we are going to be worshiping back again in this place uh, sooner, I think, than we probably hope or imagine. We're praying for the Lord to open the doors, but we expect to be back here again. And we'll also continue to do great worship services online. So we're going to have a great presence on campus and a great presence online indefinitely. But hopefully very, very soon we'll be able to be together again. Well, today we start a four-week series called Pathways. And this is really about the pathways that God has made for us to walk more closely with Him. And as we think about that, as I was thinking about this idea of kind of discipleship and growing in faith and walking with God and the beautiful pathways He's made. And I began thinking about kind of how God's made us as people, that he's made us very uniquely, but this came to my mind. I want you to imagine that you had an entire day open. I mean, wide open. You could do whatever you want. As a matter of fact, if you have little kids, someone you love, who's safe, who you trust, is coming over to watch them. If you have a busy season at work, someone's going to come and do your job for you. If you have open time but not the resources, you have the resources to do what you want for one day just to absolutely enjoy yourself, what would you do? I mean, think about that in your mind. What would you do with that one open day if you could do anything you want? Now, I'm going to tell you what you should do. Brace yourself. This is how you should spend your day. You should make a nice little pot of tea, and then you should get a little fire. Get a, fire, a fireplace. You do whatever you want. Get a fireplace. Get a little fire going in the fireplace. You should cozy up with an afghan across your legs, and read a romance novel. That's what you should do. Go do it. The next day off you get, you should do that, right? Well, for some of you, some of you, you're going, you know me. That's me. If you're me, I'm going, no. <laughs> Zero interest. Why? Because we're different. God has made us different, beautifully different. And if I tell you there's one way, this one path, this one way to spend your day on a day off, you might say, but I don't like your way. That doesn't work for me. That doesn't connect for me. Imagine I told you you could have any meal you want. Any meal you want. Now, again, I'm going to, I'm going to tell you what that meal should be. I mean, of all the flavors, of all the foods, of all the delicacies from around the world, I know the right meal that you should have. You, sh you should make some homemade, you know, tender pork carnitas. You should chop up four or five different kinds of peppers, jalapenos and peppers and, and chilies. And you, and you should eat it and partake of it, and it should be so hot that your eyes begin to water as you eat it, and your nose begins to run, and you go, you go oh, this is delicious, this is the best. That's what you should do for your, your, that should be the meal you would enjoy, right? And you go, maybe for you, and for me, by the way, that's heaven, baby. There, ch your chilies, peppers, that is glorious and beautiful. But for some people, are like, man, that's not what I want. One time, Sherry was at her parents' house in Michigan, and I was going to come and be there and join them, and she was cooking some food for me. And she chopped up three, three, I told her the three kind of peppers I wanted. She had chopped them up, and she said, I'm going to prepare a meal before you come. While she's cooking it, her parents start coughing and sneezing from the, the just the, in the air. They didn't eat it. They just smelled it. And Sherry just said, I'll never cook for Kevin that kind of food. And I mean, that, that, that works for me. Probably not for some of you. But if I told you, this is the pathway, this is the food, this is the culinary delights that everyone should enjoy, you'd go, but God hasn't made us that way. So here's the question. Why is it that when it comes to our spiritual growth, our journey with Jesus, the most dynamic being in the universe, God Almighty who came among us, why is it that we'll oftentimes say, well, we've got a discipleship pathway for you. A church or a pastor will say, okay, you're a Christian, here's how you grow. Read your Bible 10 minutes a day. Pray for five minutes and just kind of, and do this, and do that, and serve and do this. And if you do all these things, then you'll grow in your faith. And some people go, but the, but the pathway you're giving feels not only narrow, I don't even want to walk on that path. I mean, I want to get close to Jesus. I want to worship him. I want to love him. I want to get, I want to get as close to him as I can. But the pathway you're giving me doesn't work for me. The romance novel and the tea doesn't work for me. The hot spicy food doesn't work for me. The pathway you're giving doesn't work for me. Here's the good news. For these four weeks, we are going to be looking at nine different sacred pathways, biblical pictures 
of how God has designed us and the world so that we can walk in different ways. Now listen, we're all walking toward the same God. We're worshiping the same Jesus Christ. Salvation is found in Jesus' name alone. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by him. I'm not talking about different gods or different ones to worship. It's worshiping the one and only God. But there's different pathways that we go to draw near to that God. And doesn't it make sense? That's true for, for virtually everything in the world. Why not for our spiritual journey? God has made each one of us wonderfully different. And we should celebrate that. We should rejoice in that. And I want to tell you here at Shoreline Church, we rejoice in in the different ways that God has made us. One God, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of us all. We're going to focus on that one God. But the ways that we worship Him, the ways that we grow close to Him, are going to be nuanced and different and beautifully diverse, but all leading us to this same God. And there's definitely a danger in trying to force everyone into the same mold. There's a huge danger if we say every single Christian should walk the same pathway. Here's what tends to happen. Here's what tends to happen. When a church says, this is the spiritual pathway, and this is how you grow into maturity, and when you finally walk that pathway, and you finally become mature, you know who you usually look like? The senior pastor of that church. Why? Because the senior pastor of the church who's in charge kind of says, well, I think that you know, I'm spiritually mature, so I want people to be... So we start to frame this pathway, so all of a sudden, the way we ask people to grow spiritually sort of fits the preacher's style and mold. Well, I'm not going to tell you exactly the pathway for you any more than I'm going to tell you you have to eat spicy food or any more than I'm going to tell you you have to read a romance novel at, by a cozy fire. What we're going to do is we're going to see lots of different ways. And here's what I pray happens. Over these four weeks, I pray that every single person who calls Shoreline their spiritual home, I pray that you will encounter God in fresh new ways. You will love him more, worship him more passionately, understand him more clearly, hear his voice and his whispers with with, with greater frequency and greater intensity. I pray that every one of us comes to love God more with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And if you're you're spiritually searching, you say, I'm not a Christian, but I'm checking out the whole Christianity thing. Here's the good news for you. God doesn't want to squeeze you into an exact mold of every Christian looks like this. You may have met some Christians and said, man, I don't want to be squeezed into that exact mold. That's okay. As long as you're worshiping and following Jesus, God will show you ways that fit who you are. And so over these four weeks, we are going to fall more in love with Jesus. We're going to give you some incredible tools from a book to a survey tool to to small group potential to a podcast. We're going to give you all kinds of resources to walk this journey with us. So I want to ask you to pray with me and lay your heart before the Lord. If you're not a Christian, say, God, if you're there and there's a pathway I can walk that's dynamic and exciting and powerful and come to know you, God, I want to start walking that pathway. If you're a Christian, I want you to say to God, God, I'm ready to follow you in fresh new ways and discover new ways to walk in your presence. God, that's our prayer. For those who are searching and seeking, that they will find their path to you and uniquely how they can grow to know you and love you and walk with you. And for those of us that have come to know you, God, with a fresh work of your Holy Spirit, touch our hearts, draw us closer to you. May we say at the end of these four weeks, I have come to love God in richer ways with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. And that what I've learned in these four weeks will propel me into a lifetime of fresh encounters with a living God. We pray this for your glory. Amen. Well, here's the dynamic. Here's the problem. Some of us have a warped view of our time with God. Some of us kind of believe our time with God is this. You have to sit at a desk. You have to have a Bible open in front of you and a notepad or a computer and four or five other books, and, and, and your study, it feels like final exams. It feels like cramming for a, a test in school. And for some of you, you're like, that's, if that's what it means to walk with Jesus, I don't, I don't, that doesn't compel me. Or some of us have been, have been taught that the, the way you walk with Jesus is you got, and everything, everything that happens, you got to, oh, praise the Lord, glory to God. And you got to be, I know, I'm, I'm just crying, and I'm, whoa. And you're like, why? Expressing it. Some of you are like, man, that's not me. You're, come, settle down, you're freaking me out, you know. Sometimes we look at a certain way that people connect with Jesus and go, but I'm not like that. And God says, I know you're not like that. How does God know you're not like that? Because he made you. Wouldn't you expect then if he made you uniquely the way you are, that he would have prepared a pathway for you? I believe in 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 these coming weeks, you're going to kind of listen and go, man, that pathway, that's me. That's me. If I walk that way, I can come to love Jesus more and serve him more faithfully. I'm going to talk about some of these pathways, and you're going to go, that's not me. 
That's okay. If you find one or two pathways that really get you closer to God, walk those. And then kind of explore some other ones. I think that all the nine pathways we're going to look at, all of them at different moments could kind of propel us forward in worshiping God. But you're going to find some that you're just going to go, boy, that's me. God has made me to worship him, to love him, to follow him. I'm going to walk that pathway. Uh, Gary Thomas, who wrote the book Sacred Pathways, uh, and Gary's become a very good friend of Shoreline Church. Uh, he wrote a book that we're going to recommend to you and that we're going to give you a link to, that we have a link on the website, and we're going to share that book with you. But he wrote a book called Sacred Pathways, looking at these nine different pathways. And here's, the, here's a line from his book. I love this line, so I want to get it exactly right. He says, here, here, here's the thing. It's not the who, it's the how. It's not the who, it's the how. Here's what he's talking about. If you say, man, I don't, I don't feel very close to Jesus. I don't feel very near him. It's not the who. It's not that Jesus isn't worthy of praise. It's not that if you met Jesus face to face, you wouldn't fall on your knees and be in awe of him. The who, Jesus, is compelling and glorious and draws us in. What becomes dry and boring is the how. The who, Jesus, always glorious, always worthy of worship. The how, when people say, but you got to worship this way, you got to praise this way, you got to learn this way. And that how doesn't work for you. We're going to discover nine different hows, nine different pathways. And, and, and I believe you're going to find, just like you find your own way that you spend a day relaxing, just like you find the kind of food that tastes good to you and that sort of, sort of you enjoy, you're going to find your pathway. And you're going to walk more closely with the Lord. And you're going to fall more in love with Jesus. And he's going to be pleased. And you're going to be blessed along the way. As we look at these different pathways, and again, we're going to look at nine different pathways. As we look at them, you're going to see some of them kind of overlap. Some of the pathways, one's traveling here and one's traveling here, and they kind of intersect a little bit, and that's okay. There's some similarities. Some of the pathways, you're going to, you're going to listen to, to me describe it, and we're going to look at some scriptural things and hear about real-life things, and I'll give examples of how to walk that pathway. And some of those pathways, as I describe it, you're going to go, that's so me. i got to lean into that more. i got to walk with Jesus more that way. And some of the pathways, I'll be describing it and looking at it biblically, and, and it's compelling for some people. You're going to go, not me, doesn't fit at all. That's okay. That's totally okay. Because you're going to find one or two pathways that really fit you. And you're going to learn some ways to go deeper in your walk with Jesus, and that's his desire. So let's dive in. Uh, because the reality is, uh, we, we've got to kind of think, okay, God, show us different pathways so I can see if I can walk this, how I can explore it. And so the, the three pathways we're going to look at today are what Gary Thomas calls the pathways of wonder. These are the pathways that, that, that just kind of, we say, well, wonder is everywhere. When somebody sees the wonder, the glory of God, and is amazed. It happens in different ways, but some people sort of have this wonder and awe and celebration of God. All of us should have wonder for God, but some people just kind of, kind of just roll into that really naturally. So we're going to look at three pathways called the pathways of wonder. Each one's unique and different. And as you listen to these different pathways, as you get a picture of it in your mind, kind of decide, is that a pathway I could walk real naturally? Is that a pathway I could walk on occasionally? Or if, is that not for me? But if somebody else has that pathway, I want to bless that and celebrate it because God's made us differently. That's a big part of this, is not just saying what's my pathway, but not to say to other people, you're not very spiritual because you're not walking with Jesus the way I do. That's a problem. We can, we can say, you're not doing it my way. Can you look at someone else's pathway and bless it and celebrate it, even if it's different than you? That's what God's going to teach you. So here's the first, one, first pathway, the pathway of the naturalist. The naturalist. The naturalist says this, let me be outdoors. And some of you go, that's me. <laughs> some of you are already like, that, that's me. I know it. Let me tell you more about it. But you're probably right. If you're going, man, I, I meet God outdoors. We're going to learn from people who've walked this path ahead of us. I want to share some different people who've walked the path of the naturalist. I'm going to share a little bit of their story and give you kind of a picture because all through history, through the Bible, and today there's people who walk with God, sort of connecting with God through creation. Now remember, we're not worshiping creation. We're worshiping the creator. But creation points to him. So St. Francis of Assisi wrote, wrote a book, uh, wrote, wrote a song, Brother, Son, and Sister Moon. The, 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 whole, the whole song just kind of looks at how, how creation drew his heart into the presence of the living God. Not worshiping the creation, but celebrating the one who made it all so beautifully. Jonathan Edwards, maybe one of the most brilliant minds that the American colonies uh, kind of provided to the world. Jonathan Edwards was this brilliant mind, this pastor, this scholar, and he wrote a whole piece about the flying spiders of North America. 
And he wrote this whole piece about them because he had studied them and watched them. And he saw spiritual lessons and truths as he watched these spiders make their webs and as he watched what they did. He actually saw the glory of God and the beauty of God's creation in these little spiders. He actually wrote a sermon, one of the most famous sermons in the history of the world. And the picture that he had was one of these spiders dangling at the end of a thread. And how that thread just looked so fine and so, so thin that at any moment it looked like it could break. And he, thought about, and he thought about people far from God hanging kind of over the abyss and, and, and saying, call out to God. Don't, because at any moment that thread could break. And he, this whole sermon kind of is built around that idea that he learned from watching spiders. But a naturalist looks at creation and sees God and learns spiritual lessons. Along with St. Francis of Assisi and Jonathan Edwards, another brilliant scholarly mind, my wife Sherry. Uh, my wife Sherry is a naturalist. She meets God outdoors. For years, my wife Sherry was a dis distance runner. She'd ride, run three, four, five miles almost every single day. A foot of fresh snow when we lived in Michigan. I'm going out running. And when she'd come back in from running, she would be glowing. Not, not she loved the exercise, loved being, you know, just being in the fresh air, but the glow I would see on her was the presence of the Spirit of the living God because she met Jesus outdoors in her runs. Now she hikes and now she does long walks. And every time, every, when, when we go to Michigan in the summer for our break, the first day that we're there almost every year, she does a marathon. She walks a marathon. It's a highlight for her. Now, is that my pathway? I, I told her, I'll drive a marathon. But, she, but she'll walk a marathon. She meets Jesus outdoors. Praise the Lord. King David. King David was a naturalist. You know when you read Psalm 23. But listen to these words from Psalm 19. In Psalm 19, David, inspired by the Holy Spirit, writes these words. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. Now, they have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them. Yet their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. He says, they may not speak with words, but man, creation is speaking the glory of God. And all the naturalists said, amen. Our naturalists at Shoreline are saying today, man, I wish we could be meeting outdoors. I don't care if it's raining. I don't care if it's windy. I don't care if it's 40 degrees. I meet Jesus. I think people come to our courtyard services. A lot of them, they have got that naturalist way of meeting with God. And some of them have said to me, even when we're allowed to, could we never meet indoors again? Could we meet in the courtyard forever? We'll be moving back indoors eventually, but we'll probably occasionally have outdoor services. And there's lots of people who meet God that way. Jesus met the Father outdoors. He went to quiet places to pray. He went to the Garden of Gethsemane regularly because he met with the Father outdoors. I think every Christian in some ways can see the glory of creation and the glory of God revealing himself and what he's made. But some of you are naturalists. You're wired that way. And, and, you, and you need to grow in that. You need to walk more in that way. So let me talk about walking with God on this pathway, the pathway of the naturalist. And kind of, kind of picture in your mind taking a walk in a, in a beautiful place, in an in in outdoor setting, and just saying, man, that, I'd love to experience God in that kind of place. If you, if you say, I could be a naturalist, and we actually have a survey tool that we put on our website, I'll tell you about later, that you can actually use, and it'll, it'll, you'll get the answer right away as to what your strengths are, your primary pathways, and you'll also see, I just did the survey recently, and I have one really strong pathway, two kind of intermediately strong, and then I'm really weak in the other ones. But I don't need nine ways to meet with God, I just need one or two. And, and so for some of you, you know, th this is going to be a way that helps you walk with the Lord. So if, if you're a naturalist, if you meet with God outdoors, I encourage you to get outdoors and drink it in. Make time. Even during this time with COVID, if you've locked yourself in your house, go for a drive. You don't have to get out and walk. Just go for a drive. Go park along the ocean. Go, go along where Cannery Row kind of ends, and then all of a sudden there's where the, all the seals come in and where they pup their little baby pups. And you'll go, or go to Lover's Point and just park. Some of you haven't gone and really looked outside for a while. And just look and just say, oh, Lord, you're so good, so beautiful, so powerful. For some of you, you should read the Bible outdoors. A passage like this, the heavens declare the glory of God, the skies proclaim the work of his hands, Psalm 19. T take a flashlight or your phone and light that up and go out some night when it's just dark outside. Look at the skies and read this out loud. Let God's word interact with the very thing that inspired these words, God's presence and glory in creation. If, if you want to find refreshment and get recharged, you know, take a walk. 
breathe deeply and just say, God, you're a God of Sabbath and rest. As I'm outdoors, will you just breathe fresh life into me? And again, in this season where people are avoiding other people and being careful, and that's great, that's fine. But if you go somewhere, there's no other people, and just take a walk and breathe. Some of you that are naturalists, you've, you felt locked in your homes, and you're saying, I feel so far from the Lord. And part of it is that God speaks to you through his creation. So get some time to get outdoors and to drink that in. For some of you, if you're stuck inside, you can see the outdoors in pictures. You can go online and pull up pictures of any animal you want, any insect you want, any place you want. My wife Sherry's parents travel a lot. They they travel a ton all over the world. They do it on their iPad. Sherry's dad has a wonderful iPad, and he's got it hooked up to his TV. So he'll he'll say, Joan, let's let's go on a train tour through the Swiss Alps. And they'll sit on the couch together, and he'll get this tour online and put it on the screen, and they'll watch. And I'll sometimes say, Sherwin, where have you traveled lately? Oh, we went here, we went there. Oh, we're watching this eagle's nest. And we're watching the, the eggs, and slowly, and we're watching, and they've got all these cameras that they watch around the world. And it's, it's a way to connect with God's creation and see what God's doing out there. To have lunch on the beach. You want, you want to have a great experience if you live in Monterey? If you like In N Out Burger, go get an In N Out Burger. And then go over to Casa Verde Road, and it goes right into this little housing development right along the water. You guys kind of have a loop around, and you might know where it is. But when you get to the end of the loop, there's the water, and there's a bunch of uh, picnic tables along the way there, along the sand. And just sit at a picnic table and have a, have a little lunch. Or if you want to take some fresh fruit, if that's your thing, whatever, and just look at creation and just talk to God, meet with God. Listen to God speak through creation. Listen to his voice. In the crash of the waves, hear God say, I'm powerful. In the beauty of flowers, hear God say, I'm gentle and I'm creative. In everything you see, hear God's voice speaking, revealing who he is. Now, a couple of warnings if you're a naturalist, if you love being outdoors and that's kind of your thing, because that's how I meet with God. Here's a couple of quick warnings. Number one, don't treat creation like God. That's called pantheism. Everything is God. God is everything. Not true. There is one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He's the creator of things, but those things are not the creator. He is. Don't worship creation. Be careful there. Naturalists can tend to get focused on the creation so much they forget the creator. Stay focused on the one who made it all. If you're a naturalist, beware of individualism. I I don't need anybody else. I don't need the church. I don't need people. I can just meet God in creation. Well, you can meet God in creation, but we're made for more than that. We're made for community. So be careful. And I've heard a lot of naturalists say, I meet God outdoors, and I don't need the church. I don't need other Christians. Two things can be true at the same time. You can meet God outdoors, and you need other Christians. The Bible teaches both of those things. So hold to them. And then just avoid, uh, avoid the temptation to isolate, but continue to walk in community with God's people. That's the pathway of the naturalist. For some of you, you're going, man, that's me. Other ones say, well, okay, tell me another pathway. That's not quite me. Here's another one, the pathway of the sensate. Sensates declare, let me experience since they want to have an experience of something and that includes their senses, that, that let me taste it, let me smell it, let me hear it, let me see it. They, they engage their senses in a very specific way that connect them to God. Sensates love beautiful art. And when they see beautiful art, they think of God as the ultimate artist. Sensates love music, great worship music, great music that lets their, makes their hearts just kind of soar and draw near to God. Sensates love wonderful tastes and smells and sounds. Those things draw them to their God. So let's learn from people on the path ahead of us. Learning from people on the path ahead of us who are sensates. Uh, John, who wrote the book of Revelation. John, the vision he saw. Man, it was sights and it was smells. And it was sounds. And I've been, I've been learning this because the, the last year I was in a Bible memory group at Shoreline Church here in 2020. And so I get to spend a lot of time in the first two chapters of the book of Revelation. And here's part of what, what John writes. He, he writes these words. He says, I turned around. I love, uh, this confused me at first. I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. I turned around to see the voice. He turned around to hear a voice. No, but he says, I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. He says, and when I turned, he says, I saw, I saw seven golden lampstands. And among the lampstands was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet with a golden sash around his chest. The hair on his head was white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. 
In his right hand, he held seven stars. And coming out of his mouth was a sharp, double-edged sword. And I love this. And his face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. You can see it. You can hear it. You can feel it. You can almost taste the glory. John was a sensate. He, it, it engaged his senses. I think that my dad, who got to walk with Jesus for about 30 days before he went to walk with Jesus forever, I think my dad was, if he could have taken this, this survey tool that we have on our website, I think he would have found out he was a sensate. My dad loved art and beauty and music. And right after he gave his heart to Jesus, we said, Dad, would you like to listen to some music? He said, yeah, I'd like to hear Beethoven's uh, uh, Moonlight, Moonlight Sonata. And when we put it on for him, he closed his eyes and he leaned his head back. And he just, just directed the music like I'd seen him do so many times, but with a different spirit. I, I just believe that God was in his heart in a fresh new way. But some people just meet God by engaging their senses. Ezekiel was like this. If you read, if you read the book of Ezekiel, you discover that all through Ezekiel, he's, he's seeing and tasting and smelling things. It's, it's amazing. In Ezekiel 1, 4, you read this. He says, I look and I saw a windstorm coming out of the north, an immense cloud with flashing lightning surrounded by brilliant light. The center of the fire looked like glowing metal, and the fire was one that looked like four living creatures. And in verse 24, it goes over to sound. When the creatures moved, I heard the sound of their wings, like the roar of rushing waters, like the voice of Almighty God. If you look at chapter 3, his taste gets involved. Then he said to me, Son of man, eat what is before you. Eat this scroll. Then I opened my mouth, and he gave me the scroll to eat. Then he said to me, Son of man, eat this scroll I'm giving to you and fill your stomach with it. And listen to this. So I ate it, and it tasted as sweet as honey in my mouth. Ezekiel's vision is seeing and hearing and tasting. The senses engage. For some people in their worship, they need to engage all those senses. This is why some people, I think, gravitate towards some of the Eastern forms of, of worship and, and where there's there incense and clanging of bells and different, you know, and touch and sound and, and, and they have communion every single week. It's, it's they, they have that sense touch point with those things. And some people just love that. It draws them closely to Jesus. So walking with God on this pathway, how do we walk the pathway of the sensate? And, and I think about this like sitting at a great meal. If you're having a great meal with the smells and the tastes and all that's involved in it, if you want to grow, if, if you say, I meet God through use of my senses, why not have a feast? Why not plan? When we're allowed to gather together, call, you know, some of you do this. You'll have a couple couples over, some friends over, and you'll share a meal. You'll talk about life and faith and over a meal with the tastes and the smells, and you meet God in those moments. Take advantage of that. Sing songs of praise. Keep singing songs of praise. Listen to great music. Share great music. If you, learn, if you, you hear a great worship song that, that helps you connect with God, share that with other people. Even get together with people and say, let's, let's talk about different things, you know, different YouTube songs that we've heard. Play them for each other and talk about it. I do that with friends with comedians sometimes. I get to those friends and say, hey, let's just share different comed you know, comedic clips we've seen and we laugh together. Why not share different worship songs and worship together? Get your senses involved. A, a person who... who, uh, who, who functions this way, also uh, can, can engage in, in worship where they, where they visually see things. People, people who, who love this love churches that have beautiful architecture. Shoreline, we've got a couple of uh, crosses in our worship center, but this isn't like uh, classic architecture. This was a warehouse. We try to make it as beautiful as we can, and we're making it even nicer with new carpet. But some people love those things. Also, with, with, with your sight, just make a point of looking at those things that show the beauty of God. Communion. Engage in communion. We're going to do communion again a week from this Wednesday, night of worship. I want to challenge you to put it on your calendar, 6, 15, 15, West Coast time, a week from Wednesday night, first Wednesday of the month, put it on your calendar and get some really good, get some King's Hawaiian bread. And if, if, you, if you drink wine, get really some good wine or watch this grape juice, get some good grape juice so that when we have communion together, the taste of it is sweet and wonderful. I love doing communion with King's Hawaiian bread because it tastes so good and it reminds me of the goodness of Jesus. But bring your senses alive. Now, a couple of warnings for sensates, for people who, who kind of operate more out of, out of their, the, the touch and the feel of things. Here's, here's a couple of warnings. Uh, be careful that you don't simply go through the motions without conviction. So singing songs of praise isn't worshiping God. 
You say, oh, I love to sing. Okay, but are you singing to God? Are you singing about God? Are you connecting with God? Be careful you don't go through the motions without meeting the master, without worshiping Jesus. Don't just fall in love with the beauty of things. That's beautiful music. That's beautiful art. But look beyond those things to the maker of all good things. See, the pathways are all meant to lead us closer to God. And so along the pathway, we don't fall in love with the pathway and the way that we meet with God. We walk the pathway so we can fall more in love with God. I hope that makes sense. Don't, don't let the actions themselves. And then also, there's a real warning for sensates who love, who love that experience and getting all their senses involved. Don't worship worship. You hear me? Don't worship. Don't fall in love with worshiping. Fall in love with the God that you come to worship. And some people can get so involved in worshiping. Oh, I like this music. I like this experience. I like this. I like the sound and smell and, and we'll work this way. So then I can have the experience I want to have. And all of a sudden we're focusing on ourselves. Don't worship worship. Don't focus on yourself. Let worship lead you to the glory of God. So for some of you, you're a sensate. God engages your senses and you meet him that way. Great. Take some steps forward closer to God. And then one more pathway for today. The pathway of the traditionalist. Traditionalists cry out, let me remember. In their memories of what God has done and who God has been, they meet with God again and again. We think of traditional as sort of a negative word. Don't. Don't think of it negatively. Think of, think of being a traditionalist as there's rhythm to how I walk with God. There's, there's rituals that sort of connect me with God. There's symbols that open my eyes and my mind to God. There, there's patterns of giving sacrifice to God in a kind of in a regular way, with, with tradition, with rhythm in my life that connects me with a living God. For some people, this makes their heart soar and drives them closer to God. So I want to think together about the pathway of the traditionalist. Learning from people on this path, learning people on the path ahead of us who are traditionalists. Abraham in the Old Testament. Abraham had a tradition, had a ritual. When he would come to a new place, anybody know what it was? He would build an altar. Each new place he would go to, he would build an altar. Why? Because there he could worship God. It wasn't about the altar. It wasn't about the ritual. It was about the God he was worshiping. But by building that altar, it gave him a place to meet with Yahweh. That, that, that's a traditionalist. He had a rhythm. Jesus had a traditionalist spirit. He would gather with God's people regularly, regularly, regularly. He went to certain places to pray again and again and again. He had a rhythm of going away in the mornings and meeting with the Father. Rhythm ritual, creating personal traditions and, and processes that connect, you know, for Jesus, connect them with the Father, for us, connect us with our God. And I think in some ways, you can see a rhythm of, of, a rhythm of beauty and power, this ritual of traditionalism in God Almighty himself, in his creation. Read the first couple chapters of Genesis. There's a rhythm to creation. God sees, God speaks, God creates, God rejoices. God sees, God creates, he rejo and there's this rhythm that begins to happen. The, a traditionalist isn't somebody who just says, oh, I do it the old ways and I don't like anything new. That's not a traditionalist. A traditionalist says, no, with rhythm and patterns and consistency and coming back to similar experiences, I meet with God. He triggers my memories from the past and brings his presence in fresh ways into, the, into my world right now, to my heart right now. And so all, there, there's also... Uh, there's also a character in the Old Testament, Ezra. If you study Ezra's life, Ezra kind of, had, kind of had this rhythm of life from giving offerings to God, regular giving of offerings, that rhythm, from fasting, from sacrificing, a regular rhythm of fasting, from reading of Scripture publicly and privately, a regular rhythm. Traditionalists establish patterns and traditions that help their lives grow closer to God. Nothing wrong with that. There's a lot of wonderful things in that that you could maybe discover. So let's talk about walking with God on this pathway. People who love, people who love this pathway are people who love communion. When are we going to do communion again? When's our next communion service? Why do they say that? Because there's a rhythm to it. Because it brings back memories of past experiences with Jesus. Be because, because this experience of communion... And Jesus said, do this, and when you do it, remember me. Allows them to remember Jesus. It's not communion itself. It's not the bread and the cup. It's the meeting with Jesus in the midst of it all. So how can you take some steps forward if you think, if you say, boy, I think I've got more of a traditionalist bent. If you do the survey that I'm going to talk about in just a moment, you say, man, I'm a traditionalist. What are ways you can kind of grow that and nurture that pathway? Again, not just so that you have the pathway, but that pathway leads you forward and upward to God. 
What are some things you could do? Well, during Lent, the 40 days before Easter, you can go online and just pull up, you know, church Lenten experiences, family Lenten experiences. Some of you may want with your, with your kids and family to walk through a 40-day experience where every day, you kind of create a tradition of every day preparing for Easter, those 40 days of Lent. We kind of, tra- kind of tend to today jam Easter into Good Friday, Easter, three days, boom, we're done. But the church through history has taken 40 days to really each day cycle through what this means. And in that rhythm, in that cycle, in that daily tradition and act, it draws people closer to God. How about this? Think about how you start your day. What if you created a ritual, a tradition of how you start your days? My days all start pretty much the same. They, I, I've got a ritual. I wake up and I make the bed. And when I make the bed, I pray for my wife. And then I do my scripture memory because this last year I've been doing it, but I continue where I, I meditate on Revelation chapters one and two, and I'm hoping this next year to finish chapter three. But I kind of meditate through that as my next thing. Then I go to my study, and I got a chair I sit in. It's kind of a routine. I sit in my chair, and I open my Bible, and I open my journal. I like to write. So in my journal, I write down three things I'm thankful for from the day before. Because I learned that from actually Jeff Mannion, another friend of our church who comes and preaches here regularly. And and so I'll write down three things I'm thankful for. Then I'll read a scripture, and I'll I'll find one lesson from that scripture that comes alive and touches my heart. So I read read that lesson. Then I pray that lesson for me and Sherry, then for our boys and their wives and our grandkids, and then for my sister Allison and then Gretchen and her husband Marty, and I pray pray through all my siblings. Five, Five or six days a week I'll do this. And then I pray through Shoreline staff members, And then I pray through other pastors I know. And I put their initials in my journal as I do it. So in my journal right here, uh, every day for, you know, week after week and month after month, I've got a a lot of probably some of your initials in here. It looks like that. You don't have to zoom in on it. You don't need to have my personal stuff. But but at the bottom here is always K and S, Kevin and Sherry, then Z and C, and then a little baby there, and then J and T for Josh and Taylor. And it just goes through all that. And that's a, a ritual. You say, well, don't you get bored with that? Doesn't that, well, for right now, it really helps me worship Jesus. That ritual, that pattern helps me. If it becomes boring and dry, I'll find another pathway for a while. That's the beauty of the pathways. I'll find fresh ways, because I want my walk with Jesus to be fresh. But right now, that's really connecting me with Jesus. It's helping me to pray. It's helping me grow. And so use those routines. A traditionalist loves symbols. The cross is an obvious symbol, but you can have symbols that you keep, and you go, symbols, oh, that's weird, that's creepy. What do you mean you have, you have symbols as a Christian? Well, these all, everything on this table is a symbol it remi- because it reminds me of something and takes my heart back to God's glory. I got this little communion set when Sherry and I were in Bethlehem. So when I see this, I remember the one who was born in Bethlehem, and I remember the beauty of communion. I got this piece of rock when we were near where, uh, where Jericho was, and I pretended it was part of the wall that fell down, and so I got this piece of rock. Uh, this water right here in this sandal, it evaporates every few years, and I go down to Huntington Beach and put more water in here, because this is, that's where I was baptized. Uh, this ball is a hole-in-one, and it reminds me that God still does miracles. See? everything. Uh, the, these two things... Two of our military in our church gave me these. Uh, you know, Pastor Eric went gave me this when he went to Jerusalem, and I, I prayed for him every time I looked at this. And I was given this just, at, just as one of our leaders became a colonel. Uh, I was given this just a couple days ago, and these are going together in my office. Now, these aren't things that I idolize. They're things that remind me who he is. They're things that remind me what God does. And those symbols turn my heart to God. There's nothing wrong with that as long as those symbols don't become the focal point. The focal point is God. Grow in fasting. Make a decision to fast from media, to fast from some different kinds of foods. And and as as you fast, let your heart hunger more and more for God. Sacrifice is part of a traditionalist's journey of faith. So give up some things that you really love but you don't need and someone else does. Give some stuff away as a regular part of your life and make that a ritual of your worship. There are also potholes uh, to the traditionalist approach. You can have ritual without relationship. I do all these things, but I forget who I'm doing them for. I do all these things, but I forget who it is that I worship. Be careful that ritual doesn't become more important than relationship. And also, religious acts can kind of be, I do these religious things, but they don't move me out into the world to make a difference for Jesus. And so it it becomes lots of ritual and tradition, but it's not moving me to follow Jesus. We should be doers of the word, not hearers only. And so these three pathways, these pathways of wonder, a naturalist, a sensate, a tradi- traditionalist, you say, well, 
Pastor Kevin, you could have spent a whole sermon on each of these. Absolutely. I could have, but we're not going to do it that way. We want you to dig in. So I want to give you four resources before I close in prayer. And I'm going to challenge you to step into some of these. Number one, get Gary's book, Sacred Pathways. Just go online, get his book, Sacred Pathways. When we're back here meeting on campus, we'll have some copies here. People want to buy a hard copy here. But get that book and read chapters three, four, and five. Those are about those three pathways. That'll take you deeper. You want to go deeper? Uh, The weekly resources on our website. Every week we have a reading guide, and every week we have discussion questions and prayer direction on our website. Look at that. It'll take you deeper into these three. Do the Find Your Spiritual Pathway survey. That survey is on our website. Go on the website and do that survey. I did it a couple days ago, and these are my results. None of your business what they are. No, but my strongest one was the intellectual, but I'm, I'm pretty sure naturalist was my second strongest. And then contemplative and enthusiast were next. Well, I haven't talked about some of those. Come back and join us in the next couple of weeks. But I got this feedback like 30 seconds after I finished this, or three seconds. It just came to my computer. And this is helping me learn, so, learn to grow in that, those pathways. So you do that survey. And then also watch the podcast. Gary Thomas, because he's a friend of our church, he volunteered to do a podcast with me to kick off this series. So you can go on to any of our outlets. You can go on to YouTube and just put in uh, Shoreline Conversations. You can go to, to Apple anywhere and you can find our podcast. And there's one with Gary and I talking about this. At the end of the day, this is the desire of the heart of God. God wants to walk with you more closely. He wants you to grow to love him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And he hasn't given you one narrow pathway to walk. There's many pathways to walk that will all help you love God more, worship Jesus more passionately, and follow the Spirit more closely. Lord, this is our prayer as we launch into these four weeks. Lord, will you take us forward in our walk with you? May we have fresh encounters, new passion, and any pathway we walk, let let us not become so consumed with the pathway we forget that we're walking toward you and with you and looking up towards you. So Lord, help us to worship you and seek you with growing passion, we pray, for your glory and for our good, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Before I send you off with a word of blessing, a couple quick invitations. Number one, today at one o'clock, West Coast time, one o'clock, new members class. All the details are on the website. You have to go on If you go on and register, you'll get, you'll get the outline, you'll get all the notes, and you'll get direction on how to come online and join me. I'll be leading that class 1 o'clock to 2.15, and it's a great way to learn more about what Shoreline's all about, where we're going, God's vision for this church, and help you discern if you want to make this your church home. If you need prayer for anything, go on the website, and you see the address right there, and send us your prayer need. We will pray for you. And if you're new, will you text the word welcome to the number you see on the screen? And if you will text the word welcome, we will, uh, we will follow up and get to know you better and answer any questions you have and kind of walk with you. I hope next week we're outdoors for all you naturalists, but if we're not, I'll be right here. I'm going to be preaching all four weeks of this series. I hope you stay with us all four weeks and really discover how to walk more closely with Jesus. As we close this time, as you go into the rest of your day, will you walk with Jesus? Walk closely with him. Take his hand. Follow him in the way he's made you. Discover your pathway or pathways and walk them boldly in fresh new ways so that you can love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. God bless you. Have a great week, and we will see you right here next Sunday. You could take two pathways that seem like opposite, like the contempt, um, like the caregiver and the activist. Yeah. The activist... Uh, you know, is, is is wanting to do that social work out front, stopping evil. The caregiver <clears throat> is caring for the victims of evil. Yeah. They don't want to be on the front lines. They don't like confrontation. Uh, they don't think of it as fighting a battle. They think of it as dressing a wound. Yeah. Now, it, it's not just sick people. It might be helping fix a car or a computer, those things. But I, I just tell people, doesn't it make sense that God would create people who feel closest to him when they're treating the individual victims of evil and that he would create people that feel closest to him when they're trying to stop the source of evil. The church needs both. And so 
we're not altruistic. And so when we get that spiritual pop standing on the front lines, whether we're picketing, whether we're meeting with legislators, whether it's all the marches, whatever we're doing, and then you've got the people in the back saying, look, I know you were hurt by this. Let's go away and talk about it. I'm going to bind up your wounds. It's just a fuller expression of who God is. It it leads us back, Kevin, I know one of your great loves, the church. It's an expression of God's body that no one person uh, has devotion to God cornered.